السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله So I will continue, I will start كل عام وانتم بخير جميعا So in شاء الله today I will cover graves or batobacy and I will start nodular goiter. So as I mentioned previously, this files and tools not for redistribution, and also I want some interactivity for this presentation and also for the next presentations. So if anyone have any questions at any time, please stop me, let me know, and ask at any time. This is interactive discussion. Uh, so I, um, like the previous sessions, this is the summary from the previous sessions. Uh, so it is very important to understand the, the adenosine enzyme types and the, uh, which uh, enzyme present in which tissues. This is a very important in the exam. And what is the role of this deadenase enzyme in various conditions, specifically deadenase type 3, which is present mainly in the placenta. And it is very important in, for the activation of T4, uh, which converted T4 to reverse T3. And this actually is present in a lot of questions. Another very important slide is a risk stratification of thyroid nodule by sonography. And what is known as U classification, which is presented by Bridge Thyroid Association in the guidelines published in 2014. And you should know that what is the criteria for penine thyroid nodule and what is the criteria that increase the risk of suspicious for thyroid malignancy because in each exam they will ask a question about this criteria. You should know that suspicious criteria lobulated outline. Disrupted peripheral calcification, microcalcification, intranodular vascularity, taller than wider, and associated uh, suspicious lymphadenopathy. And what is the benign criteria? Peripheral axial calcification, peripheral vascularity, isoochoic or, or mild hypochoic. And actually, this is uh, my talk in uh, Cyro Alex in the previous Friday, risk stratification of thyroid nodule, comparing American Thyroid Association and American College of Radiology thyroid classification and the Bridge Thyroid Association U classifications. And actually, this presentation will be uploaded uh, in the next few days, inshallah. And in the next Friday, I will upload uh, the link for this YouTube video. And actually, this is algorithm is very important because in each, if by ultrasonography U1 or U2, in this situation, this is a benign uh, nodule and no need for follow up, except if there is high risk uh, of malignancy in this uh, person. For example, in a young person and U2, in this situation, you need to do fine needle aspiration cytology because there is a, a, a increased risk of malignancy in this situation. Uh, excuse and, me, doctor. Yes. In last session, uh, you both uh, some question uh, at the end. Uh, there is there is question about uh, 18 year old girl uh, referred by her GP when she uh, when she was found to have thyroid nodule. And by fine needle aspiration is type two. Yes. From the choice, uh, you put reassuring and discharge or repeat ultrasound in six months plus minus repeat uh, fine needle aspiration. Uh, actually, I, I will present this question because there is uh, some debates about this question uh, after a few slides, uh, Dr. Anajay. Uh, because okay, okay. Uh, as presented here, we should know that. After doing fine needle aspiration biopsy, if it is Cy1, this is non-diagnostic and we should repeat fine needle aspiration biopsy. But if it is Cy2, this is a non-neoplastic, which is mean mostly a benign nodule. 
In this situation, we should review clinical and ultrasonographic level of suspicious. If there is no increase in risk of malignancy in this situation, low level of clinical and ultrasonography in this situation, we should go to no follow-up required. But with SI2, if there is a high level of suspicious of thyroid cancer, for example, if the patient is young age like our example, in this situation, we should repeat ultrasonographic guide finding aspiration biopsy or multi uh, team discussion. Uh, so, if SI2 in a, a person uh, 30, 30 years old and no family risk of thyroid cancer and no re previous history of uh, nickel radiation, uh, no any suspicious feature of thyroid malignancy in this situation, we should go to no follow-up required. But if the patient is young and a finding the aspiration biopsy shows I2 in this situation, we should go to repeat ultrasonography finding the aspiration cytomegaly. And I will discuss uh, later, inshallah, in the uh, survey uh, example after a few slides. Uh, so, but uh, with size 3 in this situation, neoplasia is possible. This is a follicular neoplasia. In this situation, we should go to uh, lobectomy, diagnostic lobectomy. But if it is size 5, it is, uh, we need therapeutic surgery, not just lobectomy. We should go to a total thyroidectomy. Uh, so this algorithm is very important. Also, this table is just to complete the previous one. Uh, types of size. This is a fine needle aspiration cytology report. And what does psi means? And also, what is the action? In the psi 2, this is an aneuploblastic. And here, is, he, they mentioned that we should correlate with the clinical and ultrasonographic finding. And in this situation, we can go just to no follow up and reassurance. And in another situation, we should go to repeat fine needle aspiration cytology like psi 1 or psi uh, 3A. Psi 3A, which is a typical feature in this situation, we should repeat. Uh, cytology. Uh, size 3 if this is a follicular neoplasia, follicular adenoma or carcinoma. We cannot conclude that size 3 is a follicular uh, carcinoma or follicular adenoma. It is a follicular neoplasia, which uh, 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 may be carcinoma or adenoma. And in this situation, we should go to a diagnostic hemicyroidectomy because the risk of malignancy is about 10 to 40 uh, percent. Uh, for this is a suspicious of malignancy, and we should go to diagnostic hemicyanidectomy because the risk of malignancy is 70 percent. And don't forget that a, a, a percentage or risk of malignancy is very common in the exam. They ask a question like this, and actually, in the previous few years, all year, they ask uh, one of the percentage of, uh, of, the, of this, and they like a size 3A. Psi uh, 5, this is a diagnosis of malignancy, surgical excision or radio or chemotherapy of, for anaplastic thyroid cancer. But don't forget that anaplastic thyroid ca cancer, the ideal treatment is surgery. But in most cases, a surgery is, uh, is not suitable. So a radiotherapy or chemotherapy is uh, the next uh, uh, line of treatment. Uh, and also radiotherapy and chemotherapy for lymphoma or metastasis. And now thyroidal illness is very important in the exam, and don't forget that this is a low T3 syndrome, in which T3 is low, TSH usually is low, and T4 usually is low. But T3 should be low, and this is usually presented in non-clinically, uh, in critically ill patient, and usually no need to treatment, just observation and repeating thyroid function test later on, and this actually is very common in the exam. And another very common question in the previous exam, uh, they uh, give you a thyroid scintigraphy and ask about the diagnosis and or maybe ask for the treatment. And actually in the previous exam, they give uh, uh, this one and also uh, this one. So what is number one uh, mean? This is one, thyroid scan. What does it's low uptake? Yes, oh, yes, this is a low uptake cyrotoxicose. It may be a transient thyroiditis or atrogenic cyrotoxicose, actually presented like this. What about uh, type uh, number two? 
Toxic yes. Yes, this is a toxic adenoma, and the ideal treatment of toxic adenoma is surgery. Radioactive iodine is the first one, you or surgery in some situation. But radioactive iodine usually is the preferred model to be treatment for toxic adenoma. What about number three? Uh, multiple, uh, multiple nuclear, toxic multiple nuclear. Yes, this is a, a, a toxic, toxic multinuclear goiter, and also the treatment of choice is radio usually radioactive radio radio is the first choice, but we can go to the surgery in, 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 if the patient is presented by compression manifestation, for example, and this is a very common in the exam, and also if there is uh, cosmetically. Uh, preference for the patient or suspicious of lymph node in this situation we can go to the surgery and lastly the number four and this is also a very common as exam this is a typical uh, diffuse uptake which is uh, demonstrated for graves disease and the treatment of choice for graves disease usually a medical therapy the second one is radioactive iodine, and the third one is surgery. And of course, each one of these modalities of treatment have some advantage and also have some disadvantage. For example, during the pregnancy, medical treatment is the preferred one. For the woman who uh, is pregnant, uh, medical treatment is the preferred one. Uh, if the woman can to be pregnant in this situation, if uh, she will marry in the next few months, I we uh, all the recommendation prefer uh, surgery you. in this situation. But if the uh, pregnancy within uh, after six months in this situation, a radioactive may, may be preferred one, and so on. So this is a very important slide. And this is a very important slide, the mechanism of action uh, and the thyroid hormone synthesis. Dr. Khaled. Yes. Yeah. What happens if the uh, patient become pregnant after two weeks, for example, post radioactive iodine? Will we advise her for uh, medical? Sorry for this interruption. I will continue. Uh, actually, um, the question is very complicated, actually. If the female patient uh, get pregnant uh, after two weeks of uh, radioactive iodine uh, uh, ablation, um, the risk of uh, teratogenesis is very high in this situation, actually. And I will recommend uh, medical abortion but this actually require uh, a lot of a lot of decision makers this is uh, not my responsibility alone but actually we should uh, go to uh, uh, discuss it with uh, others because this is a medical legal aspect and actually is a really just uh, action so this is a not simple a question to decide it uh, now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, steroid hormone synthesis and this uh, mechanism of action of anti steroid drug is very common. In each exam, they will ask a question about the mechanism of action of carbimazole or propyl cyuracil. In the previous exam, they ask about the mechanism of action of propyl cyuracil. It inhibits uh, peroxidase enzyme. All of anti steroid drugs inhibit peroxidase enzymes, so inhibit the oxidation, organification, and coupling, cyroglobulin biosynthesis, and also the probiosyracil inhibit the conversion of T4 to T3 by inhibit the adenase type 1. This is extracyroidal inhibition, and this is unique for probiosyracil. So we prefer probiosyracil in the thyroid storm and in another situation. And another very important question, why probiosyracil is preferred than carbimazole in the first trimester? Because it is less teratogenic. Why carbimazole is preferred than probiosyracil in other situations? Because carbimazole is less side effects. Probiosyracil, more side effects in the liver. Uh, but the carbimazole less side effects and also the carbimazole is more effective but why we prefer carbimazole because less side effects uh, and the side effects of uh, anti steroid drug is very important the granulocytosis is very important once you suspect granulocytosis you should stop 
anti-steroid drug and go to the differential blood count. Uh, if a granulocyte is less than 500, so this is a case of a granulocytosis, no, no, uh, don't try to restart the anti-steroid drug. This is a fatal. Uh, how we suspect a granulocytosis? Any patient presented by fever or evidence of uh, oropharyngeal infection in this, and receiving anti-steroid drug, we should stop anti-steroid drug and do CBC with differential count. And another uh, important side effects, which is a uh, liver, uh, uh, liver failure, uh, liver damage presented mainly uh, incidence with the propyl seracil is about 10%. Uh, one in each 10,000. This is the incidence. And in the young uh, children, it is more uh, than this number, one for each 1,000 uh, population. And also, uh, we should, uh, after radioactive iodine treatment, we should avoid a pregnancy for six months. This is ideal for male and female according to the guideline, but in the Oxford Handbook, the third and fourth edition, they mention that six months for the female and four months for the female. So this is very important to know this number, and actually in each exam they will ask about a question like this. And another very important slide, the recommended act, uh, dosage for radioactive iodine for different uh, disorders for grave disease, it is 4 to 600 megabacrel, and toxic multinodular goiter, it is 5 to 800, and toxic adenoma, it is 500, and so on. This is a very important slide, and in, in each exam, they ask a question for these numbers. When to treat subclinical hyperthyroidism is very important, and actually this is from the American guidelines, and it is the same uh, for Pratch recommendation. For um, if it is such is less than 0.1, this is a, a grade two subclinical hyperthyroidism. In this situation, we should treat if the patient age is more than 65. Or if less than 65 with another comorbidities like heart failure, osteoporosis, or hyperthyroid symptoms, or monopausal, not on estrogen or bisphosphonate therapy. And if in the, the age is less than 65 and asymptomatic in this situation, we can consider treatment. But if the TSH is between 0 0.1 to 0 0.4, in this situation, we can consider a treatment by anti medication for all of uh, previous one, except if the age is less than 65 and the patient is asymptomatic. In this situation, we can go to just observe and repeating thyroid function test. This is the last one, uh, important slide from the previous sessions, how to differentiate between a TSHOMA versus resistant to thyroid hormone, uh, resistant to thyroid hormone. Uh, of course, resistant to thyroid hormone runs in family, so in family history it can be differentiated, but it is not accurate 100%. The most important is that an alpha subunit is the best one, also, TSH response to TRH is very important because in the TSH choma, there is a plant response or no change response, but in resistance to steroid hormone, it will be increased TSH like a normal individual. And another very important test, which is TSH response to T3. In this situation, in the TSH choma, no change, but in the resistance to steroid hormone will be decreased like the normal individual. This is very important. And the pituitary MRI will show in the TSH choma macroadenoma in about 70% of the cases. And the treatment of TSH choma mainly is surgery. And uh, don't forget that the somatostatin analog can be used to render the patient eosyroid before the surgery, not antithyroid medication. And this is a very important head. Uh, so I will go to the next section, which is MCQs from the previous section to just rapid revise. And uh, as I mentioned the previous, I will give uh, the, the, the three questions which answered incorrectly uh, for the most uh, uh, in most of uh, cases. So this is uh, from study BRN, and don't forget that uh, I actually updated the study BRN to 2022. Thanks uh, for uh, uh, doctor who sent me the link for this uh, website, and actually I extract all the question, and I will update uh, 
all the course by this uh, 2022. This is a 35 year old female presented with a three months of history of three weight, uh, kilogram weight loss and anxiety. So this is a, a typical manifestation of cytotoxicosis. Mild tremor of outstretched hand, the proptosis, and lead leg. Don't forget that the lead leg is not pathogenic. For example, this any cause of cytotoxicosis can be presented by lead leg. And also by examination, the neck reveals asymmetrical enlarged thyroid gland. 3.5 centimeter irregular nodule. So this is a question about thyroid nodule and asymmetrical enlarged goit. The free T4 is elevated, TSH is low, but not suppressed. A TBO antibody is positive. What is most important, TSH receptor antibody is positive. What does mean TSH receptor antibody? What does it mean? Graves disease. Graves. Oh, it is a Graves disease. But don't forget that there is a regular nodule presented with a, a, a patient presented by Graves disease. This is very important. The calcium is mild elevated in the other examination is normal. The patient was initiated on carbimazole. Which of the following is the definitive diagnostic investigation to get the diagnosis for this patient? Fine needle aspiration. Fine needle aspiration. Fine needle aspiration or radio ID and optic scan. Fine needle aspiration. Because patient, I, I, I want to diagnose the nodule is it is malignant or not. Yes, someone, Dr. Chavan, chose a radio iodine optic. Because it's already grave, so radioactive iodine will give, you, give us nothing. Yes, 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 this is a correct one. Uh, actually, you should know that uh, what is the value of radio iodine optic to Detect the etiology of cytotoxicosis. What is the etiology of cytotoxicosis here? Graves disease. TSH receptor antibody is positive. This is a pathogenic for Graves disease. So we know the etiology. What is the value of radio iodine uptake in this situation? Nothing. If Nothing. It, uh, if the trap negative, I yes. will try five radio iodine uptake scan. Yes, this is the correct. Yes, is the correct, Dr. Naja. So, in this situation, the correct answer is fine needle aspiration biopsy, and actually, uh, a lot of you choose it, but actually, why I put this? Because 35% choose it as a correct answer, and others choose radio ideal uptake and red oncogene PTH concentration, thyroidectomy, and, and so on. And actually, in the previous session, I mentioned that in any patient presented by cytotoxic, cytotoxicose, and presented by thyroid nodule, we should go to TSH receptor antibody. If it is positive, so like our example, in this situation, this is a cytotoxicose caused by Graves' disease, and in this situation, we should go to fine needle aspiration cytology for thyroid nodule to check for malignancy. And if it therapy is negative in this situation, we should go to the thyroid scan as a first choice. So don't forget this. A TSH receptor antibody in this exam, in this uh, question, is very essential to check what is the next best next step. And another one which is not answered correctly uh, in most of you, a 26 year old prime gravid female in the first trimester was referred to the endocrine clinic with vomiting, tremor, and palpitation. What does it mean, vomiting, tremor, palpitation in a pregnant female? What does it mean? This and actually, actually, normally pregnancy can be presented by this manifestation. Don't forget this. Vomiting, the tremor, palpitation may be due to the anemia, may be due to uh, normal pregnancy, and may be due to the cytotoxicosis. So this is a not a unique manifestation for cytotoxicosis. Don't forget this. During analysis of the case scenario, you need you need to highlight this bias actually. You try an ultrasound done to two weeks earlier confirmed a viable twin pregnancy. Don't forget that. When pregnancy, not a single pregnancy. The yes, doctor, I'm, 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 I'm trying to start propanolol because patient anoxia and tachycardia. This yes. Is, uh, uh, 
for this reason, I I I chose propanolol. Start propanolol. Uh, uh, the problem was yes, I, I am with you. Propanolol can be used uh, in this situation, but here they mentioned that I will go to the scenario, but actually I will uh, complete. Propanolol can be used for. Uh, if the patient is tachycardia, anoxia, tremor, but we should uh, choose uh, the, what is the most accurate one. Cyrod uh, so function test has been arranged by her general practitioner. Uh, 34 is elevated, and actually it is uh, 35, and the upper normal reference range is 22. Don't forget this. So 34 is one and a half upper the normal. If such is just 0 0.1, and in this situation, they give a reference range for non-pregnant female. Don't forget this. This is a non-pregnant reference range for TSH, not a trimester-specific reference range. On examination, she is anoxious, tachycardia. There was a minimal enlarged goiter. What would be the best next step in the management of this lady? Dr. Because of high T4. Uh, this is actually a very important question uh, in the exam and actually in uh, our clinical practice because don't forget this. Probalsaracil is teratogenic. Carbimazole is teratogenic. So if you will start probalsaracil, don't forget this. This is a categorized by FDA as category D, not C. So, the risk of teratogenicity is elevated. Actually, don't forget, if you want to compare an acid inhibitor or uh, racemblocade, the uh, ARBs is categorized as category C, but the probylsaracil is category D. So, the risk of teratogenicity with probylsaracil is more than the risk of teratogenicity by uh, captopril. So, if you want to start the propylsaracil, you should be sure 100% this is indicated medication for this condition. Uh, actually, a, a lot of you choose uh, start the propylsaracil and repeat thyroid function test two later, uh, weeks later, and this actually uh, is not the most accurate answer uh, because in this question, the, the, the most important uh, to uh, check for this thyroid function test and um, uh, try to manage it. While carbimazole, of course, carbimazole is not correct one, why probiosaracil is not correct one? This, we, this patient has had green cis gravidarum, gestational yeah, hypothyroidism. Yeah, yes, what I want to highlight for this example, actually, 34 is elevated uh, more than TSH. And I will actually um, present this is a few slides. This is uh, not, uh, but the practice is very important. Actually, Dr. Radwa chose uh, number C, which is a start carbimazole. No, 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 carbimazole, propylsaracil is not indicated, even if free to 4 is elevated more and more. Don't forget the relationship between the TSH and the free to 4. And actually, the TSH concentration is inverse related to the free T4 concentration. What uh, does it mean? And actually, I will mention this in, uh, just in Arabic. أي تغير طفيف في the free T4 بيتبعه تغير كبير في TSH. This is very important. Just a, a minimum change in the free T4 will reflected in the TSH by a very high change. So if free T4 is mildly elevated, TSH will be suppressed than normal. And actually, the thyroid disorder during pregnancy, according to the all guidelines, TSH reference range during pregnancy, a reduction in the lower TSH reference range is observed during pregnancy in almost all studies. And in some cases, TSH can be undetectable, and yet it still represent a normal pregnancy. And so, a TSH will be low and low during a 20 pregnancy more than a TSH. But why TSH is why the free T4 is elevated? According to the guidelines, we should uh, use a trimester specific reference range. And actually, most of you know this is the reference range in the first trimester. It is 0 0.1 to 2.5. And actually, in the latest guidelines published by the American Thyroid Association, they change these numbers 
to uh, another one but actually this is a preferred numbers to me and clinically it is more practical uh, in the countries in which there is no trimester specific population reference range and what about it for and the free to for the this is from the guidelines Current uncertainty around the 34 estimated the pregnancy, they put this wisdom of relying on any 34 immunoassay during the pregnancy, it is a question, a questionable. And in the guidelines, they recommend total T4 measurement may be superior to immunoassay measurement of 34. Why 34 is not accurate, we should use a pregnant assay method specific and the trimester specific pregnancy reference range should be applied and this actually is not available in most of our labs uh, and uh, actually t4 will increase according to the trimester gestational age from the week 7 to 16 and actually uh, from the week 7 8 the reference range is increased by 5% in each for each week and uh, at the week 16 uh, the reference range will be 50% higher than an pregnant female and actually this is a very important uh, from uh, this uh, paper it is more common to encounter misleading free t4 result than misleading serum tsh level in the clinical practice and in the william textbook they mentioned this this paragraph the clinician must be worried if the free t4 result by any method does not agree with the clinical state and the tsh in such cases another method should be used to estimate the free t4 and if a free uh, 34 uh, index should be measured or the result should be ignored or the result should be ignored so in this our previous uh, question as it is such uh, 34 is elevated and the t such normal according to the trimester specific reference rate in this situation i will ignore the 34 in this situation i and i will depend mainly in the tsh and this uh, patient is eu thyroid actually and in this situation we should observe and the three check thyroid function test later on uh, of course uh, starting governor may be acceptable in uh, but don't forget that don't choose a propranolol except if they mention that the heart rate number is uh, a number but if they mention the patient is tachycardia they don't choose propranolol so in each question if they uh, give you a heart rate and you uh, see it is uh, very high so you can go Yes, uh, I am uh, with you, Dr. Mahmoud, and actually uh, I mentioned the recommendation of uh, American Thyroid Association. Uh, 3T4 can be used during the pregnancy, and uh, some uh, society recommend 3T4, but uh, you should use a 3T4 with a specific reference range done during the pregnancy, not non-pregnant reference range. And this is very important, uh, actually. And if you review the Endocrine Society guidelines for thyroid disorder during the pregnancy published in uh, 2013, you uh, will see that they recommended total T4, not the free T4. So the free T4 can be used during pregnancy, but you should uh, revise the reference range of it. Uh, what about if this patient not pregnant should we recheck after two weeks or treat no no treatment actually this is a, 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 a if uh, non pregnant uh, and presented by tsh with mildly low with 34 is uh, more than one uh, and half the upper reference rate in this situation we should check uh, uh, as interference actually in this situation and if the patient is uh, tachycardia anoxious a tremor and in this situation i will start by propranolol if the patient is tachycardic enough yes uh, propranolol have uh, side effects so don't start the propranolol in any female except if there is uh, a good concern to start this uh, medication Uh, Dr. Khan.
Khaled, yes. uh, please, if this case, the same case, pregnant case, uh, she had a thyroid peroxidase or thyroid receptor antibody positive. Actually, uh, the if, will be changed. in this situation, I will start by propylene cyrosyl. If the SH receptor antibody is positive, so this is a grave disease, and we, I will start by propylene cyrosyl. But actually, if TSH receptor antibody, don't forget that the TSH will be less than this number. Actually, it will be suppressed. Okay. And, and this is a question uh, discussed uh, previously by Dr. Najah. 18-year-old uh, girl is referred by the GB when she was found to have a thyroid nodule. The nodule was spotted incidentally by her mother. The girl is otherwise fit and well. No family history of thyroid uh, disorder. No obvious cervical lymphadenomas, and the TSH is normal. So this is a EU thyroid patient presented by thyroid nodule. A predominantly cystic thyroid nodule, the size is one centimeter in weight, and the finding the aspiration cytology is done, which is reported as Cy2. What is the next most appropriate step in the management of this patient, Cy2? Uh, repeat ultrasound in six months and Re find the Repeat aspiration. or reassurance Five. and discharge? According reassurance, to uh, the repeat. benign ultrasound characteristics repeat. and the clinical... Uh, repeat, because the age is 18 years old. Yes, so there is, uh, uh, we, we should uh, notice that. Psi 2 is a benign cytology. The most important after Psi 2 is discharge, reassurance, and discharge, except if there is a suspicious feature of malignancy, or... high risk of malignancy. What is the high risk of malignancy? In age is less than 20. Oh, Family okay. history of thyroid cancer. History of neck radiation. So this is a suspicious feature of malignancy. In this situation, as the age is 18, we should go to repeat thyroid ultrasonography after six months, not immediately. So repeat ultrasound in six months, plus or minus repeat final aspiration cytology, because the age is less than 20, which is in increase the risk of malignancy. And actually, this is a very important table, a clinical feature indicating malignancy. The age is less than 20 or more than 50 in men and cervical lymphadenopathy and so on. This is, this is very important. And actually, as I mentioned previously, Psi 2, this is a non aneuplastic review clinical and ultrasonographic level of suspicious. If high level of suspicious, we should go to repeat ultrasonography guided by needle aspiration cytology. If low level of clinical and ultrasonographic suspicious or for thyroid cancer, we should go to no follow-up required. And this is very important and very debatable point in the exam, actually. Dr. Khaled? Yes. When we say that this patient is high risk for, uh, for malignancy, only one risk factor is enough, like age? Yes, like yes, yes, yes. So one risk factor is, is enough, actually. Uh, but I so, think in the uh, male uh, or the gender is not enough alone. Because 50% of the patient presented by thyroid gene will, will, will be male. So I, I will not repeat according to the gender. But if the uh, age is very important risk factor, the family history of thyroid cancer is very important risk factor. And neck radiation is very important risk factor. It disfigures horses or strider or increase uh, in the size within a few months. This is a very important risk factor. So in addition, with age less than 20 or more than 50, we should go directly for uh, repeating for that uh, after six months? At least, at least, according to the recommendation, we should repeat sonography after six months and according to the finding, plus or minus fine needle aspiration cytology. Because in the site okay. 2 actually, if there is no risk factor, we can discharge this patient from the follow-up, like you too. The patient, no need for follow-up, even after uh, several uh, years. So this is a very critical decision. But if there is a risk factor, we should repeat thyroid sonography after six months plus or minus five needle aspiration cytology. Thank you. 
And this is a very important question. What is the daily IUD requirement for adults? Uh, this is the three questions from the survey. So I will check some questions. Uh, daily IUD requirement for healthy adult according to the WHO. For adult male. 150. Yes, this is a 150. 150. But don't forget that a daily requirement for pregnant and lactating female what? No, no, they are not correct. Not 200. 250. 250. Yes. 250. Yes, this is a 250. This is a very uh, correct one according to the WHO. And this actually present in the fourth edition of the Oxford Handbook. And don't forget that uh, at uh, William's book, the 13th edition mentions that during the pregnancy is 200. And in the latest edition, they mentioned that during the pregnancy is 20, 20. Uh, 220 day, but the correct one is 250 microgram per day for pregnant and lactating females. Another one is mechanism of action of perchlorate. Inhibit iodine transport. Yes. Yes, actually inhibition of coupling and iodocyrene. Of iodocyrene, this is uh, for uh, anti steroid drug. Oxidation for anti drug. So, it perchlorate inhibit the iodide transport. Don't forget this. And another question: a Patient, 28 year old female, present with an anxiety and a tremor. Examination: uh, Pulse 88. Find a tremor. Modest goiter. Faint bruit. No eye sign. 34 is elevated. TSH is normal. And the TSH receptor antibody is normal. MRI butyter reveal 0.9 centimeter microadenoma. Which of the following would be the most appropriate initial treatment for this patient? Radio, radiotherapy. Why radiotherapy? What is the diagnosis here? Somatostatin anomaly. This is a it's case of TSHOMA actually. Yes, microadenoma. So this is, this, this is a T This is a T choma. So okay. the best treatment modality, initial treatment, is somatostatin and a loop. Somatostatin. Oh, the best ideal treatment is surgery. 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 Yes. So a somatostatin and a loop is initial, the best modality of treatment, but the best treatment is surgery. Okay. Another question, a patient presented by Graves' disease, uh, received the uh, carbimazole for one, 18 months. Uh, and what is the rate of remission after five years after discontinuing therapy? 50%. 50%. 50 or 40%? 50%. 50 40 and actually, uh, this is uh, actually, you, you, will, uh, you will see 50 or 40, but actually, the most commercial is a 40 40 percent uh, uh, actually it is a 40 to 60 percent uh, according to the, a lot of uh, conditions but but if you see 40 only one uh, number choose 40 percent and uh, this is the last question uh, in this uh, review a 22 year old woman um, and as as i mentioned previously you can skip the scenario and just read the question which one of the following subgroup of the woman should be considered for biochemical screening for thyroid dysfunction during the pregnancy and as i mentioned previously no consensus statement about whom to screen but it is uh, most of them are expert opinion so which one of the funk subgroup of the woman should be considered for biochemical screening for thyroid dysfunction during pregnancy e residents in iodine depleted Uh, if you want to exclude, actually, the family of thyroid dysfunction is one of the most important risk factor for development of any thyroid disorder. So if you cannot be sure 100% that the residence is the ideal replaced region, please don't choose this. If you don't be sure 100%, so you can exclude some of these options in the real exam. Diabetes is one of the risk factors, but type 1 diabetes, not, and also to some extent type 2 diabetes. But monogenic diabetes 
is not a risk factor for thyroid cancer. So the right answer is a family history of thyroid dysfunction, and actually, the age is more than 30, family history of autoimmune thyroid disease, goiter, anti-TBO is positive, presence of other autoimmune disorder like type 1 infertility, miscarriage, radiation, iodine deficient area, not uh, iodine related area. Morbid obesity body mass index more than uh, 40. Uh, this actually is a question from the uh, uh, previous slides, uh, previous sessions, and I will go to okay. the sessions about the graves or obesity. Excuse me, doctor, about the question of the remission rate. I think the same question in the. In uh, the a question which the question? BRA. This one? Remission rate? No. This one. Uh, remission rate, 50%, 40%. Yes, yes. this is one. Same question in the study BRN uh, ask about the rate of relapsing. A relapse is the opposite one. In this situation, a relapse is about 50 or 60 percent. Yes, and the choice, uh, the correct answer, 50 percent. I can go to this question from the, the actually, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, what is the other choice? Is 40 by 60 percent is present or no? Uh, I can go to this one. So I will go to this one, study BRN. Question 14. I think no, there is no 60 percent. Yes. Yes. Uh, for this situation, uh, there is no 60 percent. Yes. So this is the uh, one uh, study BRN. Uh, this is one or this is one. Uh, mortality. This is the mortality. This is one. This is one. What is the most yes. uh, reflects the relapse rate after the treatment with anti -steroid? There is no 60%. Yes, no, there is no 60%. So uh, you, you should choose which is uh, according to the numbers. If there, for example, in this situation, if there is no 40%, uh, 35, for example, I will choose 50%. So uh, you will choose according to the uh, most accurate number. Remission rate is about 40 to 60%. The relapse rate is about 60 to 40 percent. So this is a very important number. Uh, so I will go to the graves or pathology from, uh, and this is a page from the uh, fourth or third edition of the Oxford. And I will go, I will cover today, inshallah, graves or pathology, medical treatment and surgical treatment, and the graves dermatopathy and thyroid acrobacy and I will uh, go to start the multinodular goiter and the solitary adenoma. And uh, don't forget that the extra-thyroidal manifestation of the autoimmune thyroid disease, it is uh, graves or pathology or infiltrative dermatopathy or thyroid acrobacy. And this is three features is pathogenic for graves disease, but may be presented in another autoimmune thyroid disease. So a Graves or Batomacy is clinically evident in about 20% of the patient and also can be diagnosed in another 30% uh, by the imaging study CT or MRI. But uh, the most important the etiological factor in the Graves or Batomacy is lymphocytic infiltration or accumulation of hydrophilic glycosamine glycan. Uh, which secreted fibroblast and which activated T cell cytokine. This is a very not very important here, but we should know that in most of the cases presented by Graves or Batomacy is mild self-limiting disease. But actually about five percent more is the female males and elderly have a severe disease that is written site. The risk of Graves or Batomacy is higher in the female but it is more severe in the males. And of course, the prevalence is decreased nowadays because the uh, decrease of smoking and actually in early detection and the treatment of fiber is very important 
and very important cause for decreasing the prevalence of graves or patopathy. A peak onset between 40 and 44 years and another peak 60 to 64 years. And actually about 85% of patients develop a Graves disease within 18 months of a Graves or Batobacy. So Graves or Batobacy can precede Graves disease and in another situation can be presented following diagnosis of Graves disease. A high level of T-cell receptor antibody identify a high risk patient. A current smoker, more than 20 uh, cigarettes per day, are more likely to develop a grave of pregnancy and also increase the risk of uh, severity. Don't forget that 5% of patients with graves or patopathy have hypothyroidism. And in this situation, it, uh, TSH receptor antibody usually is a blocking receptor. And actually, 5% of graves or patopathy are presented in a patient, EU thyroid patient. EU thyroid patient. So most of the graves or patopathy presented in a gra with a graves disease, but 5% present in uh, hypothyroidase or EU thyroidase. Uh, Zoom no, will stop yes. within one minute, so we will join immediately. Dr. Khaled, if TRAV is negative, that will rule out uh, grave orbitopathy? Uh, in most cases, actually, sensitivity is about 95%. Uh, 95, uh, 95%. So if it is uh, negative, it will exclude the grave orbitopathy by about 95%. Like a grave disease, actually, some cases of grave disease, the essential receptor antibody may be negative. And uh, uh, don't forget that the TSH receptor antibody is one of the best uh, for a Graves or Pobesi. Continuous smoking and uncontrolled hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism moderately worse in a Graves or Pobesi. So the most important uh, modality of treatment for a Graves or Pobesi is start by stopping the smoking and controlling of thyroid disorder. Don't forget that there is an ocular emergency if there is a corneal ulceration or congestive of salmopathy or optic neuropathy. In this situation, we should refer the patient urgently to the ophthalmologist. So this is an ocular emergency if there is a corneal ulcer, congestive or patopathy, optic neuropathy. This is a need urgent referral. So, as I mentioned previously, about 90% of the case of thyroid associated or is presented with hyperthyroidism, and about 6 to 10% in the EU thyroidism, or 5%, and this is a commonly grave disease, usually moderately to severe, and usually bilateral and asymmetrical, mild asymmetrical. But 5% presented with hypothyroidism, which is Hashimoto's thyroiditis, or a graves with a blocking antibody, and in this situation, usually the graves or patopathy is mild and symmetrical. Retraction, a clinical feature of graves or patopathy, retraction of the eyelid is a very important manifestation. It is the illest and most common sign of a graves or patopathy. The upper eyelid is retracted upward, or the lower eyelid retracted downward. So there is this sign will be appear. This uh, sclera is appears above uh, uh, below the eyelid. So this is eyelid retraction of the eyelid, which is an ill ear illest manifestation and common manifestation of a graves or patopathy. Persistent visual blurring may indicate an optic neuropathy and require urgent treatment. Severe conjunctival pain, don't forget that pain, conjunctival pain, is an indicator of corneal ulceration and may require urgent refer. This is pain means active, graves or patopathy. So don't forget that conjunctival pain means active graves or patopathy. And I will discuss this later. The mechanism changes the orbit of the graves or patopathy. Don't forget that there is extraocular muscle and adipose tissue and an optic nerve. In this situation, the extraocular muscle will be expanded and also the adipose, adipose tissue will be hypertrophied, leading to forward and displacement of the eyeball outward, causing proptosis 
and eyelid resurrection. So this hypertrophy is extraocular muscle hypertrophy and also adipose tissue proliferation will lead to exophthalmus and eyelid retraction. And at the same time, the muscle will, will compress the optic nerve, leading to optic nerve compression, which is, uh, may affect the vision, which need rapid surgical intervention. How to investigate a case of a proptosis? According to the guidelines, they recommend one of the classification, which is known as NOSBEX classification. And this classification actually is presented in the EUGO uh, guideline published in 2015. And I will uh, just uh, give a hint about it, which is not actually very important clinically or in the exam. Uh, and according to the guideline, we should uh, know that the soft tissue involvement is very important, which lead to conjunctival uh, erysema, chemosis, uh, and uh, some uh, foreign body sensation. And don't forget that the CT and the MRI scan of the orbit is very important because they will demonstrate a large amount of the extraocular muscle. And also can be uh, diagnosed another etiological cause of proptosis. For example, uh, some cases they may be presented by uh, orbital uh, lymphoma, for example, and we can uh, diagnose it incorrectly as a Graves or pathology. And after CT or MRI, we, we will find that there is uh, a tumor behind the glue. And actually, in the previous exam, they give a summary question like this. A patient presented with Graves or Patopathy, and they give a high picture uh, and a great eye sensation. What is the next step? And they mention that there is a color vision, and another one which is a visual evoked uh, potential. What is the most important that uh, I would uh, mention that visual evoked uh, potential is not uh, essential tool for assessment for graves or patopathy. So this is a not correct answer. So the correct answer is a color vision. In each case of uh, graves or patopathy, we should go to, we, we should do a slit lamp examination, we should do color vision examination, we should do visual acuity examination, and some of cases require CT or MRI. But a visual effect potential is not used for assessment of a graves or patopathy. And another question, Graves or Patopathy, and they give a picture and they presented by a unilateral uh, Graves or Patopathy, and the patient already treated with some medication. What is the next step? Usually MRI orbit or CT orbit to identify another clinical causes of a Graves or Patopathy, which may be cellulitis, which may be uh, a specific bank lesion, and so on. So MRI orbit is very important. And actually, I give this slice from um, website. This is a normal uh, CT uh, orbit. This is the extraocular muscle. And actually, this is a normal extraocular muscle. But the, and, and this is the hypertrophied extraocular muscle, which is uh, hypertrophied. And also, this is no proptosis, but in this image, this is a proptosis with hypertrophied of extraocular muscle, and this is may be presented in some exam. And another CT, uh, to, uh, I present this to differentiate between a CT and MRI. This uh, the B is MRI, this is MRI image, and this is CT. And actually, CT is more accurate for uh, identifying the uh, bones in general. And also, the extraocular muscle is more uh, appeared with a CT, uh, not MRI. MRI showing increased extraocular fats. This is the fats. This is the white uh, region is a fat, extraorbital fat, which is fairly normal looking extraocular muscle. Extraocular muscle by MRI here is appears normal. But actual extraocular muscle by CT is diagnostic. And actually, in our previous exam in 2018, they asked a question like uh, the scenario I mentioned previously picture of elderly male with a history of a grave disease and received radioactive iodine since three years. 
and they presented nowadays with a unilateral eye swelling. What, which test is very important? Important. Next. CT, CT or P? Yes, CT is the best one. Uh, don't forget that after a radioactive iodine test, such receptor antibody will be presented for a long time. But uh, an, an anti steroid medication or surgery will decrease the level of this such receptor antibody. But the radioactive iodine will exacerbate the such receptor antibody for a short time, and the such receptor antibody will still present it for a long time after uh, the patient rendered e thyroid. So, it is such receptor antibody has no rule for follow-up, follow and what is the most important in a unilateral graves or pathophysis is doing CT or P. Anti-TBO, anti-TG has no rule, thyroid scan also has a no rule for a graves or pathophysis. One of the most important uh, items and the complicated items in many in, in assessment of graves or pathophysis is to know the clinical activity and the severity. This is a two different entity you should know activity and severity. And actually, according to the latest guidelines published by EU Google in 2021, they, they mentioned that the treatment decision are based on clinical activity and severity and the duration of a graves of pathophysis. Because after uh, 18 months of a graves of pathophysis, there is mostly fibrosis of the tissues and anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive treatment is not effective in this situation. So we should uh, assess our patient immediately by clinical activity and severity and the duration to give the ideal treatment. And actually, this is uh, demonstrate the relationship between activity and the severity. Activity usually at the start and decline the patient rendered in inactive and the severity has another beat and later on the patient will be inactive and my severity is mild. So activity, we should classify our patient to active or inactive graves or pathophysis and we should uh, classify our patient according to severity to mild, moderately to severe, and size threatening condition. And uh, this is another recommendation published by this, the same guidelines. Clinical activity and severity of graves or pathophysis should be assessed according to the standardized criteria, and the graves or pathophysis be categorized as active or inactive. This is the activity and severity mild, moderately to severe, or site threatening. So severity three classification and activity two classification. The first one is a clinical activity score. This is the activity score. We should classify our patient to active or inactive. If clinical activity score, this is a seven points, each one will receive one point, and we calculate and uh, the total or submission of the points. If the clinical activity score is less than three, this is inactive graves or pathopathy. If it is three or more, this is active graves or pathopathy. Two noses, two pain, two redness, three swellings. Pain, retrovalvular pain, or pain on gaze either upward or downward or even a side uh, to the another side gaze. So to pain, any pain will increase activity risk. Redness for, of the eyelid or conjunctiva. Swelling of carankel. This is, I, I actually, I put this slide to know the carankel or uh, plica. This is a carankel or plica swelling or a swelling of the eyelid or a swelling of the conjunctiva. If the uh, clinical activity score is more than three, this is active graves or pathopathy. If there is pain, redness, swelling, this is uh, demonstrate three points, this is active graves or pathopathy. And actually, in the previous exam, in 2016, they asked about what is the most important sign of the active thyroid eye disease. Pain or horizontal gaze or a greater eye or proptosis. 
actually pain. Pain is one of the marker assessment of activity. And another question in 2020, they ask about the sign of the active inflammation. They ask about the sign of the activity. Conjunctival edema, which is the swelling of the conjunctiva, this is a, 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 a manifestation of the activity. El orbital edema is not, el orbital edema is not uh, this edema. Here, swelling of the crankle, swelling of the eyelid, swelling of the conjunctiva. El proptosis exophthalmus is not, is not items in the activity. Another one which is assessment of severity and we can classify graves or patopathy to mild graves or patopathy, moderate to severe graves or patopathy, side threatening graves or patopathy. According to these items, eyelid retraction, exophthalmus, soft tissue involvement, extraocular muscle involvement, and corneal involvement. So this is the items to classify graves, severity of graves or patopathy. Eyelid retraction, exophthalmos, soft tissue involvement, extraocular muscle involvement, corneal involvement. We can classify our patient as a mild graves or patopathy if there is a minor lid retraction less than two millimeter, but it is a moderate to severe if a lid retraction is more than two, more than or equal to two millimeter. Mild soft tissue involvement, well classified, it's a mild graves or patopathy, but moderate to severe soft tissue involvement will classify it into moderate. Exophthalmus less than three millimeter or more than three millimeter. Mild corneal exposure, it is a mild graves or patopathy, but if it is uh, corneal breakdown, it will classify it as a site threatening graves or patopathy. No retransient diplopia, it is a mild graves or patopathy, but if there is a diplopia, significant diplopia, it is a moderate to severe graves or patopathy. This is a very important to classify graves or patopathy according to the severity. And this actually, don't forget that a radioiodine therapy can worsen a steroid eye disease like this picture. So this is how to differentiate between mild graves or patopathy and moderate to severe according to these five items. The eyelid retraction, if less than two, it is a mild. If it is more than two, it is moderate to severe. Exophthalmos by millimeter, soft tissue involvement, extraocular muscle involvement, and corneal involvement. And actually, this is a table from the latest guidelines published by the EU Google. And they mentioned that to diagnose mild graves or patopathy, we need one or more of the following criteria. But to classify it as moderate to severe, we need two or more of the following criteria. And don't forget that mild graves or patopathy, it is a feature of graves or patopathy, have only a minor impact on daily life. But moderate to severe patient without sight threatening graves or patopathy, whose eye disease has sufficient impact on the daily life. Sight threatening graves or patopathy, or very severe graves or patopathy, patient with this thyroid optic neuropathy and or corneal breakdown, and this is an ocular emergency, and patient required immediately urgent referral. Need usually intravenous pulse steroid therapy, and usually require a surgical intervention to save uh, vision. In NOSPIC, Classification is another modality for treatment of assessment of severity, but this is not actually uh, ideal and actually it is uh, difficult to uh, memorize. But don't forget that no specs mean no, which is no sign of symptom, or only sign or no symptom. S soft tissue involvement, B proptosis, E extraocular muscle involvement, C corneal involvement is sight loss and we calculate and uh, classify our patient according to these items. Uh, actually, I will uh, back this slice to know uh, the activity and severity. And actually in this situation, this is a mild and active. Why it is a mild? Because if we see there is no lead lag, Exopsalmus is mild. Why it is active? Because there is 
redness in the conjunctiva, for example, and mild periorbital edema and conjunctiva redness are present. And this is the same example, but as there is no redness, so this is inactive mild graves or patopathy. Mild inactive. So if there is a redness, this is usually active graves or patopathy, and this is actually from the picture, it is a moderately to severe and active graves or patopathy. Both uh, uh, image, it is a moderately to severe active graves or patopathy. Another one, it is this, this actually it is a severe graves or patopathy unilateral, and this is actually it is inactive graves or patopathy with residual proptosis and lid retraction. And this is actually inactive graves or patopathy with residual eye muscle restriction. And lastly, this is a unilateral graves or patopathy. This is a unilateral graves or patopathy. And actually, we should go to CT orbit or MRI orbit. And another very important in the exam, which muscle uh, is uh, mostly affected in graves or patopathy? Inferior rectus and medial rectus, the most common muscle to be involved in the graves or patopathy. Inferior rectus, which is uh, leading to defective elevation, and medial rectus, which lead to convergence defect. And actually, I uh, put this image to uh, identify the most common muscles which be affected with uh, graves or patopathy, medial rectus and inferior rectus, because this actually is a very common in the exam. Uh, graves or patopathy can affect vision. And actually, graves or patopathy can be presented by dry eye disease in about 65% and may be presented by diplopia in about 50%, photophobia, decreased visual acuity, visual field defect, reduced color vision, and this is about in about 70%, 7%, and may be severe and vision threatening and optic neuropathy in about 5 to 10%. Examination for possible optic neuropathy, don't forget that history of poor vision is very important criteria. Recent rapid changes the vision or poor color vision are reason for prompt referral. And another very important one, it is a visual equity with less than 6, six over 18 warrant referral to ophthalmologist. And another very important one to assessment of color vision is by using Ishihara color ablate. And actually, I put this image from Ishihara color vision ablate. And actually, I write the correct number that I see by myself. And each one can check color vision affection by comparing the colors he read from this plate and uh, numbers I put according to the my vision. So here I see 51, here I see 69, and here I see 74 uh, numbers. If you see numbers uh, not like this, you should check your color vision um, uh, with uh, an ophthalmologist. So, uh, is anyone see a numbers other than my numbers? Okay. We are all fine. Okay. Uh, so, I, I bought this uh, another um, feature that uh, er, er, require urgent referral. Okay. Symptoms that need urgent referral to ophthalmologist, unexplained deterioration of the vision, awareness of a change in the intensity of or quality of color vision, history of the eyes suddenly popping out, a globe subluxation. Another signs that require cornea uh, urgent referral, obvious cornea obesity, obesity or edema. What is the differential diagnosis of graves or patopathy? This is very important. Mycenae gravis, orbital myositis, carotid cavernous fistula, orbital tumor, progressive external ophthalmoplegia. And actually, I put this table, and mycenae gravis, don't forget that mycenae gravis may cause diplopia, but diplopia is 
worsened at the end of the day. But in the graves of Batopathy, it diplopia is often worsened in the morning. Orbital myositis may affect the eye muscle group, and the muscle group mostly is different than the muscle that affected in the graves of Batopathy. The carotid cavernous fascia, the onset of the symptom is rapid. Orbit tumor usually rapid, progressive, and unilateral, and can be diagnosed by CT or MRI. Progressive external ophthalmoplegia is a slowly progressive over several years. And mostly the patient don't complain of diplopia despite obvious restriction of the eye movement. This is a progressive external ophthalmoplegia. How to manage, and actually this is a very important uh, topic in this uh, presentation, because in each exam they will ask about a question about the management of graves or pedopathy. Don't forget that in most of cases of severe, moderately to severe graves or pedopathy, intravenous corticosteroid is the corner stone for the management. In medical or immunosuppressive drug, Glucocorticoid, the first one, intravenous glucocorticoid. Previously, they mentioned that oral glucocorticoid is the corner stone, but nowadays, intravenous glucocorticoid is the corner stone for management of severe, uh, moderate to severe graves of pathology. Orbital radiotherapy is the second choice. Mycophenolate, mofetil, cyclosporine, tebrotuumumab, rituximab. Emerging biological agents like belumumab. This is a, a very important drug. And another drug, which is selenium, which is a, a non-immunosuppressive medication, selenium. And the surgery, orbital body decompression, squint surgery. And the last one is lead surgery. So, medically treated of graves or pathology, what is the simple maneuver? Most patients don't require any treatment. Most of the patients just improved after improvement of hyperthyroidism or spontaneous resolution. Sunny glasses, a topical lubricant is very important. Botulinium toxins may be required for the persistent upper lid retraction. Head elevation during the sleep or diuretic can be used. And don't forget, in some previous exams, they ask about a patient presented by proptosis and retraction of the eyelid and mild case. In this situation, just artificial tears or topical lubricants is, is sufficient for management of graves or pathology. Previously, they mentioned that a glucocorticoid at a high dose is the first line therapy. This is actually from the third edition of Oxford Handbook, but in the, from, in the fourth edition, they mentioned that intravenous glucocorticoid pulse therapy has an advantage of a fewer side effects than high dose oral corticosteroid. So, acute treatment of active or pathology is by intravenous glucocorticoid. Effectiveness is more likely in those with diplopia and in, at a neutral gaze and inflammatory component to ophthalmoplegia. Intravenous glucocorticoid is the first line modality for treatment rather than oral glucocorticoid. Usually, for example, intravenous glucocorticoid 0.5 gram mesylipredinazolone weekly for six weeks, followed by 0.25 gram weekly for six weeks with monitoring of liver function test, and we should give proton pump inhibitor to avoid gastritis and peptic ulcer, and we should give bisphosphonate for some individual to avoid osteoporosis. Glucocorticoid at high dose improve or pathology in about 60 to 75% of the cases. Of course, in intravenous glucocorticoid were significantly better in reducing a clinical activity score than an oral glucocorticoid, but and also adverse events were commoner patient receiving oral glucocorticoid. And also, high doses have been seen to induce a liver cell failure, so we, we should monitor a liver function test in any patient receiving high dose of intravenous glucocorticoid. The dosage is, uh, no, is not 
very important except in a clinical practice if you manage a patient like this. But the optimal cumulative dose of methylprednisolone intravenous is about 5 gram. And actually, for the second dose, we give a higher dose up to 8 gram. Can be used for more severe form, but increase the risk of hepatic necrosis seen in a higher doses. Another drug that can be used is steroid sparing agent like mycophenolic mofetil as a supreme, mesotrexate, cyclosporine, but these drugs is a second choice and can be used in combination with intravenous glucocorticoid. Don't forget that urgent referral to ophthalmologist is indicated for any suspicious of opt optic neuropathy or corneal ulceration. And actually, multidisciplinary clinics are strongly advised. Orbital radiotherapy is the second choice. Indications for lens sparing orbital radiotherapy are similar to those for high dose glucocorticoid. Radiotherapy works by killing retroorbital cells. Treatment with both radiotherapy and the glucocorticoid is more effective than either alone. Selenium is recommended in a dosage of 100 microgram twice a daily for a patient presented with mild graves or batopathy and recent graves or batopathy and recommended for six months according to the guidelines. Retexumab, this is a monoclonal antibody directed against the beta cell CD20 and this is actually induced beta cell depletion Retexumab induce a fall in TSH receptor antibody. Uh, actually, uh, 10 minutes, I, uh, and uh, we will uh, have a break for uh, praying and uh, for 15 minutes. So I think I just uh, have um, less than one, uh, one hour and uh, finish this session. So after 10 minutes, we will uh, have a break. So, rituximab induce a fall in TSH receptor antibody and depletion of the beta cell in the retroorbital tissue. Uh, rituximab cannot replace intravenous methylprednisolone, so this is a second choice and can be combined with uh, intravenous methylprednisolone. And a very important drug nowadays. Yes, yes, actually, Dr. Hana, I will give uh, this. Uh, Dr. Hana ask a question. When actually we use a rituximab in the, the treatment of graves or patopathy, actually, I will uh, discuss it uh, later. I will uh, give some algorithm from the guidelines. So I will uh, show it uh, after a few slides. This is a very important immunoclonal antibody drug. Hebrotumumab, this is a human monoclonal antibody inhibitor of IGF-1 receptor. So don't forget that this is a mechanism of action. And actually, in the next uh, exam, they will ask a question about this drug actually, because this is an emerging drug and um, uh, will reduce proptosis. And what is very important uh, to know about uh, this drug, adverse effect, hyperglycemia. So this drug can cause a hyperglycemia. Tebrotuzumumab. Tebiza. This is the... I think it's a, this is the only one approved? Yes, nowadays it's the only, one, the approved only for... one approved for management of graves of batubasi. Nowadays. But actually, I think in the next few months, a lot of other drugs will be approved for this uh, indication. So, the mechanism of action, monoclonal antibodies that bind insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor and they block its activation and signaling, used for treatment of thyroid uh, graves or patopathy, and adverse effect in muscle spasm, nausea, alopecia, diarrhea, and fatigue, and hyperglycemia. And this actually is a trial in which uh, dr this drug is approved. This is a patient presented by the, at the baseline. And after re receiving the drug, this is the image. And in the first uh, uh, top one, this is the patient receiving placebo drug. And after 24 weeks, no change from the baseline. So this is the patient in this situation. In this, the patient received 
Ibiza, and in this just receive the SIBO. So this is the difference. The drug is very promising drug. This is another drug that used for management of graves of patopathy, mycophenolate. Don't forget, we need to monitor CBC and liver function test. They brought you the map. We should monitor blood uh, glucose and liver function test. And another one, we should monitor lipid profile and liver function test. And this is the dosage. And this is actually uh, table extracted from the, I think, uh, nature endocrinology. And this is actually the current and potential therapeutic targets used for management of graves of patopathy. And don't forget that most of this immunosuppressive drug is used uh, a lot of trials for the management of Graves' disease. And not uh, not at any time. Actually, we, Dr. Aradwa, uh, can we start at any time? Should we start this? Actually, most of this drug is very expensive. Actually, uh, this is a second line therapy nowadays. Not a first line therapy. First line therapy is intravenous glucocorticoid. And this is a drug, actually, I will not comment about this slide, but I bought it. Uh, actually, if anyone want to capture it, and actually, I, I bought it in uh, my uh, notes, uh, which I will upload it. And so, don't forget that uh, glucocorticoid is a corner stone. Another drug which mycophenolate and as a suprine or IGF-1 receptor monoclonal antibody tebrutumumab. And uh, another drug which acts on the T, T and beta cell glucocorticoid orbital radiotherapy and another as a suprine. In beta cell depletion like rituximab, CD20 monoclonal antibody and interleukin-6 uh, monoclonal antibody uh, to ciliuzumab. And selenium, which is a selenium protein, which is antioxidant. And this is the level of the evidence and the studies uh, published. So a surgical treatment of graves of patopathy, and I will uh, actually, I will summarize all these drugs in the next uh, few algorithms. But the surgical treatment of graves of patopathy, short decision making is recommended for selecting second line treatment after failure of intravenous glucocorticoid. What is the second line treatment? Second course of intravenous glucocorticoid or oral glucocorticoid combined with orbital radiotherapy or mycophenolate mofetil as a supreme cyclosporine rituximab or watchful waiting strategy. Rehabilitation therapy like orbital decompression surgery or squint surgery or eyelid surgery as a last option is needed in the majority of the patient when a graves or patopathy has been conservatively managed and inactivated by immunosuppressive treatment and is still agonizing the patient. So surgery usually is not for acute uh, cases. Surgery for decompression or the orbital decompression may be indicated for urgent treatment or for optic neuropathy. Surgery for strabismus is another one. Eyelid surgery is a final stage of any surgical approach and aim to adjust upper and lower eyelid position to improve comfort and appearance. How to treat this is a summary stop smoking, dark glasses, control thyroid function, prism for globia, consider selenium for recent and mild inactive graves or patopathy. A greatness we use. Artificial tear and simple eye ointment, eyelid retraction, tape eyelid at night to avoid corneal damage, proptosis, head elevation, diuretic, systemic corticosteroid, radiotherapy, orbital decompression, ophthalmoplegia, orbital decompression, and orbital muscle surgery, optic neuropathy, urgently, systemic steroid, radiotherapy, and surgery, orbital compression. And actually, in each year, they give a question like this. In 2021, they presented a case, Graves eye picture, where patient closing his eye and cornea is still visible. So visible cornea on the eye closure, what to do? In the, this, actually, the doctor Khalid, uh, he mentioned that he chose urgent referral as visible cornea, but 
usually urgent referral if there is a breakdown in the cornea. According to the scenario and manifestation, urgent referral may be an indication. And another question in 2020, they ask about a sign of the active inflammation. Don't forget that, that conjunctival edema is one of the signs of the active inflammation. And this algorithm will uh, very important as approach for management of a grave or pathology. Actually, I will start this algorithm after uh, 15 minutes as a break. So I will start, we, we will rejoin again uh, after 15 minutes from now. Okay? Okay, Victor. So I will continue. And actually, this is a um, yeah, recent paper up there uh, presented in the Clinical Serology, which is uh, official journal of American Serology Association. A given teratuximab may increase the remission in the young patient with Graves' disease. So this is uh, some of uh, recent uh, drugs that may be used in the management of Graves' disease, other than radioactive iodine ablation and the surgery or anti-steroid drugs. There are a lot of new medications that uh, may be uh, used in the management of Graves' disease. Uh, so I will go to the Graves' or Batopacy treatment. And actually, in each year, they uh, will ask a question about uh, this uh, slide. So this is a very important uh, how to manage. In any patient presented with graves of patopathy, we should restore the and maintain eucyrodism. Uh, advise people to, who smoke to stop, use artificial tear and assess disease severity and or activity. This is a very important. Uh, and, and we as a, we classify our patient into three categories, mild disease according to severity, moderate to severe disease, and site threatening disease. If there is a mild disease, we can consider selenium. If the patient is a stable and inactive graves or pathopus, so we, we may need rehabilitation surgery uh, in some situation if there is a cosmotic reason or uh, another indication. But if the uh, mild disease progresses to the active moderately to severe disease, we should go to intravenous glucocorticoid. In a case of mild disease, we can consider intravenous glucocorticoid if a substantial effect on the quality of life. The patient has a low quality of life. In this situation, we can give intravenous glucocorticoid as a trial, and this, this, they may improve a mild disease and uh, regress the disease. Don't forget that most of cases of graves or pathology regress spontaneously without any medication. But if in a case of moderate to severe disease, we uh, with active or pathology, in this situation, intravenous glucocorticoid is the first line therapy. If the patient respond well to the treatment, but not completely resolve it, we can consider a glucocorticoid with addition of mycophenolate. If the patient is stable and inactive graves or pathology, in this situation, we go to rehabilitation, rehabilitation surgery if indicated. But in the case of the moderately to severe disease with inactive graves or pathology, we go immediately to rehabilitative surgery. No need for intravenous glucocorticoid as the patient is inactive graves or pathology. But in a case of site threatening disease, in this situation, we should give intravenous glucocorticoid. And if there is poor response to treatment within two weeks, we should go to the surgical decompression surgery. And in this situation, most cases require rehabilitation surgery for strabismus or lead, uh, eyelid surgery. And actually, this is a very important algorithm for management of graves of patopathy, if extracted from the guideline published in the previous year, uh, European Group on Graves of Patopathy, a clinical practice guidelines for the medical management of graves of patopathy. And this actually is updated guidelines from the previous one published in 2016 in combination with EU GOGO and European Thyroid Association. And they classify the management according to the mild Graves disease and moderately to severe Graves disease, first line therapy and second line therapy, and lastly, site threatening uh, Graves or Patopathy. In all conditions, 
we should stop the smoking, we should treat steroid dysfunction by anti-steroid drugs, this is the preferred method, uh, and avoid atrogenic hypothyroidase, refer to thyroid eye clinic if risk factor present likely active graves of patopathy, smoker, high TSH receptor antibody, unstable severe hyperthyroidase, and we should search for dry eye syndrome. In management in local artificial tear, especially with the dry eye, of salmic gels cornea protection during the night, and we can give selenium supplementation for six months, fasting intake. This is very important, fasting intake. And if the quality of life is markedly impaired, we can discuss low dose immune modulatory drug in a case of active graves of patopathy or rehabilitative surgery in the if inactive graves of patopathy. In a case of the moderate to severe active active graves of patopathy, the first line of treatment is intravenous glucocorticoid, 0.5 half gram intravenous glucocorticoid per week. For six weeks, plus mycophenolate sodium. If the response is partial response, we can give a 0.25 gram intravenous mesalipredinazolone per week for another six weeks, plus mycophenolate sodium. If there is response, so we can stop therapy. But if no response in this high dose of intravenous glucocorticoid, we can go do the second, we should go to the second line treatment in the form of reduximab, oral glucocorticoid with cyclosporine as a supreme, or a reducera, orbital reducerapy, uh, tebrotumumab, reduximab, and tocilizumab. So, so these are all the second line treatment or High dose of intravenous mesalipredinazolone. Previously, we start by five gram, uh, zero point, uh, about three to four gram mesalipred intravenous mesalipredinazolone. But in the second line of treatment, we should increase the dosage of intravenous mesalipredinazolone to seven point five gram as a second course over six weeks. So. Another uh, first line of treatment is to start by a high dose intravenous mesalipredinazolone, 0.75 gram intravenous mesalipredinazolone per week for six weeks. If there is a response, partial response, we can give another lower than this dose intravenous glucocorticoid. If no response, we should go to the second line treatment. But if there is inactive graves or patopathy, we should go to immediate rehabilitative surgery. The second line of treatment for moderate to severe graves or patopathy, as I mentioned previously, in the form of intravenous mesalipredinazolone high dose, or a prednisolone with cyclosporine or as a supreme, orbital radiotherapy with oral or oral or intravenous glucocorticoid, tebrotumumab, and so on. What about site threatening graves or patopathy? or optic neuropathy, in this condition, we should give intravenous mesalipredinazolone 0.5 to 1 gram as a single dose repeated on a three consecutive or alternative day with a daily monitoring of ophthalmic parameter. After one week evaluation, if the therapy can be continued, yes. In this situation, further with intravenous mesalipredinazolone, if response, Good response. We go, we go to a lower dosage of intravenous missile prednisolone per week for less than eight gram per cycle. If partial response, we should go to the orbital decompression surgery. And from the start, after one week of this pulse therapy, if no response, we should go to orbital decompression surgery. So intravenous glucocorticoid is the best one. Plus. Orbital decompression if no response or poor response in the case of sight, threatening, graves, or patopathy. And actually, this is a very important uh, table uh, from the guidelines published uh, by ETA, European Thyroid Association, in the, for the management of graves disease. This is table is important clinically, actually, because um, in our clinical practice, if anyone see a case of a graves or patopathy, uh, most of us exclude radioactive iodine ablation as a treatment modality, but actually 
according to the guidelines in a case of according to the severity and activity of graves or patopathy. If the patient is mild and inactive graves or patopathy, in this situation, all of modalities uh, with uh, anti steroid drug, radioactive iodine, uh, surgery is uh, maybe uh, suitable. But if you choose radioactive iodine in this patient, mild and inactive, in this situation, steroid prophylaxis in selected cases. And also, in a case of mild and active, the same, but in this situation, as there is active graves or patopathy, steroid prophylaxis warranted in all cases. So, in a case of inactive graves or patopathy, no need for steroid prophylaxis except in specific situations. But in a case of moderate to severe and inactive, in this situation, in medication and the surgery is the preferred one, and also radioactive iodine with steroid prophylaxis can be used. Don't forget that in mild and active, selenium may be used for six months. But in the case of moderate to severe and active graves or patopathy, no rule for radioactive iodine ablation of surgery. The best one is medication. Site is threatening. Medical therapy is the best one, anti steroid drug. So, an anti steroid radioactive iodine is contraindicated in a case of moderate to severe and active graves or patopathy. Site is threatening graves or patopathy. Otherwise, radioactive iodine can be used. Um, so, uh, graves dermatopathy is um, um, just uh, one slide. This is a rare complication of a graves cytotoxicosis presented in about 0.5%, and this is usually pretypial location in about 99% of the cases, so it is called the pretypial myxedema. And this is usually localized accumulation of glycosamine glycan. This is usually asymptomatic, can also be pruritic and tender. A treatment, a treatment usually not required. Potent topical fluorinated steroid can be used but not uh, very effective. Most of cases remit completely, 25%. 50% are chronic or no therapy and beneficial of topical steroid or remission rate is unproven. Another very rare, very rarest manifestation of Graves disease is cyrotopathy, which is a clubbing. This is a painless and no effective treatment for this cyrot acrobacy. Uh, and actually, I am, uh, share uh, three slides about a new therapeutic horizon for Graves hyperthyroidism. As all know that a treatment of Graves hyperthyroidism, usually anti steroid drug, radioactive iodine, and uh, surgery. But nowadays, and this is a recent uh, paper published in the Endocrine Review, which is uh, official journal of Endocrine Society, they mentioned that these are all new drugs that uh, manipulate the basophysiological causes of graves hyperthyroidase have a potential effect and uh, may be used uh, in the future, in near future, actually, for management of graves disease. And actually, I would mention that uh, Prof. Dr. Aliala Juri in, Cyro in the previous Cyrolix, uh, previous Friday, gave a very important presentation about uh, updated management of a Graves, or, 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 uh, a Graves disease, and uh, she mentioned a lot of these uh, drugs as a future uh, therapeutic agents for a treatment of a Graves hyperthyroidism. And this is actually uh, the table which advantage and disadvantage of therapeutic options for uh, anyone who wants to read more and more about uh, the future of a Graves disease. So, uh, you will go to the goiter, uh, which is the last uh, topic today, inshallah. Goiter define a thyroid enlargement. And don't forget that goiter not mean thyrotoxic. Goiter may, in most cases, a thyroid patient, but may be presented in a hypothyroid or hyperthyroid patient. The commonest uh, thyroid disease is a simple diffuse physiological goiter. So, any goiter, we should differentiate between diffuse or non-diffuse goiter. Diffuse goiter decline with age. Goiter prevalence increased in a long-standing iodine deficient area. 
the overall prevalence of goiter in the urinary plate population is less than 5%. And don't forget that this is what is known as Pemberton sign. In any patient with uh, thyroid uh, multinodular goiter or diffuse goiter, we should uh, examine for retrosternal extension of the goiter that may cause a compression manifestation by elevation of the bus art. If there is a congestion in the face like this, when the patient elevates his arms, in this situation, this is, means that this is goiter is retrosternal, retrosternal goiter, which compress, compress the trachea. And in this situation, the patient is preferred to do a surgical intervention to avoid a uh, compression. What is the etiology of the goiter? Simple goiter, uh, autoimmune thyroid disease like Hashimoto thyroiditis and Graves disease, nodular thyroid disease, endemic goiter due to the iodine deficiency or dietary origin, pregnancy, physiological increase in the goiter is uh, manifested in all pregnancies, but this is a mild increase in the size of the goiter. Thyroid cancer drug induced, uh, like an anti thyroid drug, uh, lithium amiodarone. Thyroiditis, thyroid hormone resistance presented by simple goiter, tsechoma, and acromegaly. And don't forget that thyroid hormone biosensitive defect may be presented by simple goiter. So, thyroid is more in the female, 4% higher in the female. And don't forget that thyroid nodule, less than 5% of the thyroid nodule are malignant. So we should exclude this risk of malignancy to uh, be, uh, and this is our priority. What is the etiology of thyroid nodule? The common cause of colloid goiter and nodule is cyst, lymphocytic thyroiditis, and benign neoplasia like the hair cell cell uh, adenoma, follicular adenoma, and malignant thyroid nodule like the papillary and follicular thyroid cancer, which is known as differential thyroid cancer. And inshallah, we will discuss it uh, in a separate session. An uncommon cause of thyroid nodule, granulomatous thyroiditis, infection, and another malignancy, medullary thyroid carcinoma, which is non-differentiated, uh, medullary, and anaplastic, metastatic, and lymphoma. So we will cover thyroid cancers in a separate sessions, inshallah. Uh, Adenoma and adenomatous, this is not very important, but what is uh, important to us that in multinodular goiter, most of them are sporadic, but there are a familial multinodular goiter. And in this situation, we should check for uh, germline mutation. And one of the very important uh, syndrome in the exam, wh what is known as Cowden, Cowden syndrome. What is the most important for Cowden syndrome? B10. This is the gene mutation, B10. And this is a tumor suppressor gene. And actually, we will cover Cowden syndrome in a special chapter. And don't forget that Cowden syndrome, this is a, a syndrome characterized by multiple hamartoma that affect breast thyroid endometrial cancer. So any female presented by breast lesion, thyroid lesion, endometrial lesion, close your eye, eye and choose if this is a Cowden syndrome. This is a P10 gene mutation. This is inactive mutation of P10. So this is autosomal dominant condition. So any case scenario presented by breast lesion, thyroid lesion, endometrial lesion, so this is a Cowden syndrome. You need to know that it is autosomal dominant condition. It is inactivation mutation in the B10 tumor suppressor gene. What is the endocrine feature of Cowden syndrome? non medullary thyroid carcinoma, usually follicular thyroid carcinoma, follicular thyroid carcinoma, or multinodular goiter, benign multinodular goiter, or thyroid adenoma, or parathyroid adenoma, which is extremely rare. So, Cowden syndrome, in each exam, they will ask a question about Cowden syndrome. And uh, we will cover it in inherited uh, in the chapter 9, inherited endocrine syndrome. A very important uh, topic, which is toxic adenoma or toxic multinodular goiter. This is autonomous functioning 
thyroid adenoma, this is a benign nodule. Usually in the thyroid scan is a single nodule which is a hot and sometimes a uh, uh, multinodular toxic nodule, sometimes causing hyperthyroidism. So a toxic nodule to be toxic, the size is more than two centimeter and in most cases more than three centimeter. And most of them due to the somatic mutation in the genes that code for TSH receptor alpha subunit of guanine nucleotide stimulatory protein. So this is a TSH receptor mutation. It produces thyroid hormone synthesis without TSH stimulation. The frequency of TSH receptor mutation in the adenoma varies from 5 to 80 percent. And actually, in each in the previous exam, they give a uh, uh, thyroid scan like this uh, and ask about a management which is best treated by radioactive iodine. And don't forget, this is a Graves disease. So this is a Graves disease, and this is a toxic multinodular goiter. The evaluation of multinodular goiter, we should search for excluded malignancy. Asymptomatic thyroid mass may be discovered either by clinical or during routine investigation. We should search for, for a large thyroid mass, previous history of radi radiation, because th this increases the risk of malignancy, increases the risk red flag for uh, thyroid malignancy, family history of thyroid cancer hoarseness, dysphagia, if the age is less than 20 or more than 60, don't forget that in some uh, atoll book mentions that the risk of malignancy is more than uh, 50 years age. But here in the Oxford handbook, they mention that the risk of malignant if the age is more than 60 years. So less than 20 is very important, but the uh, elderly age is, uh, is different from source uh, to another source. The risk of malignancy is similar in patients with a single or multiple nodule, but thyroid nodules are more common in the females, but more likely to be malignant in the male. In physical findings suggestive of malignancy include firm or hard non non nodule, recent history of enlargement, fixation, regional lymphadenopathy. And this is what is known as Bimberton sign, which is a sign of superior vena cave obstruction caused by thyroid nodule, which is due to the retrosternal compression. A hot nodule in a radioisotope scan make malignancy less like. So a risk of malignancy is very, very low in a hot nodule, so no need to do fine needle aspiration biopsy because the risk of malignancy is very low. And actually in a 2021 exam, they ask a question about a patient presented by thyroid nodule and his age is 78, solid, hypochoic, and you too. What to do next, reassure or fine needle? As the age is 75, I will recommend doing fine needle aspiration biopsy because the age is a risk factor for thyroid cancer. But if the age is 40, for example, in this situation, I will choose reassurance. But in this situation, I will choose fine needle aspiration cytology. But if this is a, a Actually, if the nodule is a long-standing nodule, for example, since 20 years with no other uh, suspicious feature, I will go to reassurance. But if a recent nodule in elderly patient uh, and due to, I will go to fine needle aspiration cytology. Yes, solid hypochoic, but if it is a solid and hypochoic, Dr. Hana, since a very long duration in this and not changing the size and not change in other features in this situation, I will reassure. But if they mention that this recent hypochoic U2 that you are in a patient, in elderly patient, I will go to fine needle aspiration biopsy because a uh, risk of malignancy is increased in this age group. And if the patient hypothyroid, Dr. Khaled, will that yes. be the same? So if the patient is So this is Bamberton sign. In the, any patient presented by nodule, I will ask him to raise his arm. If facial plethora presented, this is a compression manifestation, like this is a retrosternal compression. And in this situation, I will go to the surgery, even in uh, uh, otherwise asymptomatic patient. And uh, don't forget that this CT is very important in the exam because in each exam they will give a 
picture like this is the CT scan showing retro sternal multinodular goiter with a compression of trachea. This is the tracheal white arrow, and this is a multinodular goiter which is a black arrow. And in this situation, this is a compression manifestation. In a previous exam in 2022, they asked a question like a patient presented by a goiter and CT neck with a pressure symptom, 50 ye 55 year uh, female, a treatment surgery. And another one, 86 year old male asymptomatic for a long time. Also, once a compression manifestation, I should go to the surgery. And another one in 2020, the same scenario, patient presented by retrosternal goiter and swallowing difficulty. In this situation, the patient is EU thyroid and barium bari mealy swallow showing compression manifestation. I will go to the surgery. Radio AD is not candidate. It can reduce the size of the goiter, even in non-toxic goiter, but need a very long time to make its effect. So a clinical fissure raising the suspicions of malignancy, as I mentioned, in age, short history of enlarging nodule, local symptom, previous exposure to radiation, family history of thyroid cancer or men syndrome, Gardner syndrome, and I will uh, just give a hint about Gardner syndrome, which is familial large intestinal polyposis, familial polyposis coli, Cowden syndrome, which is autosomal dominant, became dominant inherited multiple hematoma, breast, thyroid, endometrial. If there is a lymphadenopathy, if there is a history of Hashimoto disease, it increases the risk of lymphoma. T TSH level, if it is elevated, increases the risk of malignancy. Gardner syndrome, this is a rare familial autosomal dominant condition characterized by multiple small and large intestinal polyposis tumor, osteomas, soft tissue tumor. It increases the risk of papillary carcinoma and also colonic carcinoma develops in about 70%. And colectomy is recommended once polyps appear in the Gardner syndrome. This is a table is important that actually I discussed it previously, clinical feature indicating in malignancy. And don't forget, for the age is less than 20, this is increase the risk of suspicious of malignancy. How to investigate in a case of nodular goiter? And fine needle aspiration cytology is the gold standard uh, modality of investigation. The serum TSH, if it is low, then I will go to the thyroid scan. If it is such as normal or elevated, I will go to fine needle aspiration cytology. It's my right flow volume loop if we suspect tracheal obstruction, CT scan, or MRI. So in a previous exam, they asked a question about a patient presented with thyroid detour and the TSH is low. What is the next step? What is the next step? If TSH is low and thyroid nodule, what is the next step? Dr. Mahawish? According to TAB, uh, uh, to uh, TRAB. Actually, I, I don't... Uh, you, your voice, I, I don't listen to your voice. I actually, I... Is my voice clear or not? It's clear. Yes, it's clear, yeah. And the TPO I, I want positive. to listen to your voice. I don't uh, actually... Is my voice clear? Yes. Dr. Mahawish, I uh, actually... I, uh, I see just your uh, icon is, uh, you speak, but uh, actually I did it not this. Uh, uh, anyway, yes, my voice is clear. Yes, it's clear, Dr. Khalid. Dr. Nayah, can Dr. you speak you said it's Hashimoto or thyroiditis, and the TPO is positive. I want to be sure that... Um, Everything is okay. okay. So actually, any patient presented by thyroid nodule, the first step is doing TSH. If TSH is normal or elevated, in this situation, I should go to final aspiration biopsy according to the ultrasonographic feature and better. But if TSH is low or suppressed, in this situation, I will go to the thyroid scale. 
if it is a hot nodule, I will go to the serial radioactive iodine after re rendering the patient eosyroid. And if it is cold nodule, I will go to find inspiration cytology according to the risk stratification or risk pattern. So how to treat toxic multinodular goiter? As I mentioned previously, the antithyroid drugs are effective in controlling the hyperthyroidase, but are not a curative. How to treat a curative? A radioiodine is the best one, is the first choice as a definite treatment, and commonly induced an eosyroid state. And the dosage of radioactive iodine is 5 to 800 uh, megabicryl. The surgery is uh, suitable if there is a compression or recurrence of the goiter or for cosmetic issue or uh, there is a suspicious of malignancy. For example, if it is size 3F, for example, in this situation, I will go to the surgery to uh, remove and to be sure that this is a benign cytology. A non-toxic multinodular goiter, the uh, surgery is a preferred treatment for choice in, in non-toxic goiter. If there is a local compression symptom or cosmetic disfigurement, or there is a suspicious of malignancy in some nodules. What about the radioactive iodine in a non-toxic uh, non -toxic nodule? Radioiodine may be particularly indicated in the elderly patient in whom surgery is not appropriate, but don't forget that radioactive iodine will shrink. Uh, so a non-toxic multinodular goiter treatment for choice is surgery if there is a local compression, cosmetic disfigurement, or suspicion. We need uh, ju just, uh, inshallah, a few slides and I will uh, um, finish these sessions. So a radioactive iodine uh, is effective in managing a reduction of uh, non-toxic goiter uh, by 50%, but need a longer duration. In hypothyroidism, following the radioiodine occurs in about 20%. Radiofrequency ablation is another modality for the treatment of non-malignant thyroid nodule. And of course, the best response was recorded in a nodule less than 10 millimeter volume. A medical treatment by levothyroxine is not recommended because a risk of arrhythmia and bone loss osteoporosis is increased with no beneficial with suppressive therapy by levothyroxine. And this is actually thyroid nodule in pregnant females increasing the size during the gestation, increasing the number need for needed aspiration by biopsy as a higher risk of malignancy like a general population can be operated upon in the second trimester or postpartum. And actually, this is the last slide in in my presentation today. And I just uh, we have six. Uh, MCQs uh, uh, to finish this uh, session, inshallah. Uh, so I don't know, uh, is it uh, possible to uh, someone to read, but I um, I hope to listen are to you, him. Are you listening me, Dr. Khaled? Actually, I did not uh, receive your voice, Dr. Najah. I will... Yes, actually, I mute my for my computer. So uh, for this reason, I didn't. Uh, now, okay. are you listening me? Yes, yes, yes. I just <laughs> mute uh, my computer. Actually, uh, so I hope the previous is recorded in the session. I hope so. So um, I I hear your voice, Doctor Anja. Yeah, so anyone um, read this question? 42-year-old bank manager presented to her GP with six-week history of feeling generally unwell and with a double vision. She had also noticed redness in the white of the eye with a greedy sensation for previous few months. On examination, she was a diarexia with redness of the conjunctive but lid retraction and the abruptosis that was more marked in the left eye. Eye movement were not restricted and the visual acuity on formal testing was normal. System examination was unremarkable. Testigation 3T4 is normal and TSH is normal. Uh, Anti-TBO antibody negative. C-reactive protein is normal. 
which one of the following is the most likely explanation for her visual symptoms and signs? Mm, I think grave is uh, orthopathy. Yes, actually, if, uh, we cover graves or pathopathy, so uh, even um, um, other conditions uh, cannot be, uh, be excluded 1%, but the most common is graves or pathopathy. So uh, this is a case of a graves or pathopathy. And don't forget that the uh, orbital tumor, why we choose orbital tumor in this scenario, uh, no any symptoms or signs suggestive of orbital tumor. And this is actually is... Uh, can be diagnosed by CT or MRI. So the most common, even if in a case of a TSH is normal, because as I mentioned previously, about 5% patient in patient, patient in patient presented by Graves or Batopsy, the TSH is normal. And in another 5%, the TSH will be elevated, uh, hypothyroidism. And in about 90%, the patient presented by Graves disease. So don't forget that lead retraction conjunctival uh, erysema, uh, proptosis. This is a manifestation of a Graves or Patopathy dub, double vision, a great sensation. This is a manifestation of a Graves or Patopathy even in eosyroid patient. Yes, Dr. Hana, this is eosyroid Graves or Patopathy. And the T-cell receptor antibody may be positive in this scenario. Yes? Another question, and actually this is from a tool book, the second edition. This is one and previous one. Can I read? Yes. A 50-year-old man with grievous eye disease complained of dryness and the greatness of the eye. On full of virus in the thyroid planet, he was on block and replacement regimen of carbamazole and thyroxine. On examination, his blood rate was 80 beats per minute, and there was no goiter. He had redness and the chemosis of the conjunctiva, as well as of the eyelid. He had bilateral exophthalmus and lid retraction. Although the although visual acuity was normal, there is no restriction of eye movement. Corneal examination and the slit lamp was normal. CT4 was normal. CT3 was normal. TSH also was normal. Which one of the following is correct description of his grave or gravity? Based on clinical profile. Active and mild, active and moderate to severe, active and size threatening, inactive and mild, inactive and moderate and severe. He is active and mild. The active and mild. Actually, actually, this question is difficult, but you should know that. Uh, how to differentiate between active and inactive, and how to differentiate between mild, moderate to severe, and site threatening. And actually, uh, we can exclude some some items, actually. For example, redness, chemosis, uh, uh, chemosis of the conjunctiva and uh, eyelid. This is a uh, let the patient is active. So we can exclude inactive, which is option D and E. And also there is no manifestation of sight threatening. So we will exclude option C. So is it active and mild or active and moderate to severe? No and restriction of eye movement. Uh, so I, I will actually in the tool box, they will choose active and moderate to severe. Uh, and active, I, I, as I mentioned, it's, it's assessment of activity to pain, redness, and the swelling. If it's three points from this, this will let it active. So we have a redness of the, and ecomosis. So redness of the eyelid and conjunctiva, a swelling of the eyelid and conjunctiva, let the clinical activity score four. So this is active disease. But this is a mild or moderate, actually, it needs to check for lead retraction, uh, millimeter, soft tissue involvement, exosalmos. Here, he did not mention the exosalmos uh, by millimeter or lead retraction by millimeter. 
and small uh, soft tissue involvement and the blood present or not. So, so we cannot differentiate between mild and moderate severe from this case scenario actually. So is it active and mild? I can accept this uh, answer. Active and moderate severe, I can accept this answer. I cannot differentiate between these two items from the clinical case scenario actually. But in the atoll book, he answered it as active and moderately severe uh, severity. If anyone has a comment about this scenario, it is a welcome. Uh, Dr. Hana mentioned that bilateral exosomes means moderate. Actually, no. Because here he mentions that to differentiate between mild and moderate to severe according to the exophthalmos, if it is less than three millimeter above the normal for gender and race, it is mild. If exophthalmos is more than three millimeter above normal for gender and age, it is a moderate to severe. And actually, we need a one or more option to classify it as a mild, and we need two or more to classify it as a moderate to severe. So, exophthalmos per C is cannot differentiate between mild and moderate. To differentiate, you need to determine the uh, level of exophthalmos. Dr. Khalis, what is the difference between constant and constant? Yes. What? Difference between inconstant and constant. Or constant. The, it the, means what? The blobia may be in constant or constant. The blobia, this is a significant or non-significant blob. But I, I am with it. The blobia, if it is presented here in the blobia, but actually, if the blobia is not present and other manifestation is presented, also we can classify it as mild or moderate. So moderate. The blobia per C cannot. Uh, classify it as mild or moderate. So it is very important. Once the manifestation is more, this is will suggest of moderate to severe uh, lesion. And so this is also the table I mentioned previously, how to differentiate between mild and moderate to severe graves or patopathy according to the eyelid retraction, exophthalmos, soft tissue involvement, extraocular muscle involvement, uh, and corneal involvement. Another question from the toolbook. <laughs> yes. I will read this question. Okay. Thirty-eight year old teacher was reviewed in the thyroid clinic uh, on a routine follow-up visit. Uh, she had background history of grave star toxicosis for which she had been on carbimazole therapy for the previous 12 months. Um, she complained of ongoing dryness of the eye and the gritty sensation. On examination, her visual acuity and eye movement were normal. There was no proptosis or, ex or exothalmus. There were no features of corneal or conjunctival involvement. Uh, thyroid function tests, they were normal. So which of the following would be the most appropriate measure for the management of hair uh, grave arthropathy related symptoms? Uh, artificial tears. Yes. So topical steroid has no rule in the management of grave zorbatopathy. Don't choose topical steroid. Astazolamide is not has uh, no rule in management of grave zorbatopathy. So our our good selection artificial tear selenium steroid. Systemic steroid. So, as in this, our patient is mild graves or patopathy, just the patient uh, complained from a dryness and the gritty, so artificial tear is the best one. So, a trying scenarios like this, and this is not act, uh, active, Dr. Asana, so the artificial tear is sufficient to control his manifestation. What is your opinion in the next presentation, inshallah, to highlight uh, uh, some words like this or no? Uh, actually, I highlight some uh, words like this, is a very important uh, words in the question. Uh, this is um, best or uh, to uh, leave the question 
as it is without highlighting any words from it. Highlighting is very, is very good this, idea. Yes. Okay. Because, uh, we concentrate very about the uh, very important point in the question. Okay. So uh, this is from the atoll. A lacrimal gl gl gland expressed such receptor antibody. An active Graves disease, an entity such receptor antibody can induce lacrimal gland inflammation leading to dry oil. In a chronic disease, lacrimal gland may undergo fibrosis, and so the malignant graves or patopathy, mild graves or patopathy, smoking cessation, restore a thyroid state, use of lubricants such as artificial uh, tears, mild time eyelid tapering to prevent exposure to hepatitis, elevation of the head, use of brazen for double vision, and rarely botulinum toxins. So selenium can be used as a therapy for recent uh, mild active graves or patopathy for six uh, months. Another question. And actually this question, I, say, I think in most of exams, the uh, question like this about a clinically activity score. Okay. 24 year old women presented to uh, the thyroid clinic with symptoms of anxiety, palpitation, heat intolerance, and weight loss. She also complains of redness and the greatness of her eyes. On examination, she had conjunctival redness and chemosis with bilateral proptosis. Uh, thyroid function test result of 3T4 is high, 3T3 is high, and TSH is low. TSH receptor antibody positive. Which one of the following is used as uh, a parameter to assess the clinical activity score in patient with the Graves arthropathy? I think A, I lead erythema. Yes. So this is the criteria, as I mentioned previously, to pain, to redness, three swelling. So the intraocular pressure is not. The steroid hormone level is not a criteria for activity score. Level of the TSH receptor antibody, a lead leg is not a, a parameter in the assessment of uh, activity score. So I will read the question immediately. Which one of the following is the illest and commonest sign associated with the Graves or patopathy? Which one? Retraction. Lead leg or lead retraction? Lead retraction. Yes. As we mentioned the briefs a lot of time, a lead retraction is the illest sign of cytotoxicosis. And of course, don't forget that lead retraction is not basogonomic for a Graves disease or lead leg. The basogonomic for a Graves disease, a Graves orbitopathy, dermopathy, and uh, ophthalmopathy. And another question, which of the following in this case may have contributed to the development of Graves or Batopathy? A patient presented with a Graves disease, treated with, with carbimazole, with relapse, and elect to receive radioactive iodine, but after this treatment, develop some greatness and irritation of the eye. Which of the following in this case may have contributed to the development of Graves or Batopathy? Deteriorate the Graves or Batopathy. Which one? Alcohol? Myopia, previous treatment with cyanamide, smoker, oral contraceptive pills. Yes, smoker. Yes, smoking is a major risk factor for development of a Graves or Patopathy, actually. So, in each time you manage a Graves or Patopathy, or you see a patient of a Graves or Patopathy, please assess the smoking and insist to stop the smoking and they try to link, and actually this is a, a correct one, a link between the smoking and deterioration of a Graves or patopathy. And uh, the last question today, inshallah, which of the following would be the best to confirm the likely underlying diagnosis of Graves disease? Which one? Thyroid function test, ultrasound of the neck and antibody, thyroid function test and antibody, thyroid function test, and scan and antibody and this question is uh, mentioned previously so i want 
everyone to answer it correctly. Thyroid function and antibody. All of you choose B or anyone need to choose scale to diagnose the Graves disease. Thyroid function test and antibody, yes. No, the antibodies is enough. Yes, and uh, actually, this is the correct one B, thyroid function test and antibody is enough to diagnose, and this is from the guidelines published by the NICE in 20 November 2019. Testing for people with confirmed thyroid adult uh, test, measuring TSH receptor antibody, consider technician scanning of the thyroid gland if TSH receptor is negative. So, a TSH receptor antibody and thyroid uh, function test are sufficient for diagnosis of Graves' disease. And ultrasonography is not required except if there is a palpable thyroid nodule. Uh, so, I will go to the, my summary. This is the most important slide today. A clinical activity score, we should know these items and declassify our patient to, uh, act, to active if the case score is less than three, to, this is inactive, and active if, if clinical activity score is three or more. And another one to, the, to classify our patient according to the severity to mild Graves or pathopathy, moderate to severe or site threatening or very severe Graves or pathopathy. This table is very important. And when to Urgent refer your patient to ophthalmologist if there is some symptoms or signs. This is very important, and this is an approach to uh, management of Graves or pathopathy. This is table. Uh, this is algorithm is very important, and actually this is extracted from a paper published in the Nature Endocrine, but it is the same as the algorithm published in the uh, ETA guidelines in 2016. And these tables I uh, uh, discuss it in more details in the session. So how to ma manage a mild Graves or pathopathy and how to manage moderate to severe and active Graves or pathopathy first line treatment intravenous misaliprednisolone. Each dosage is important. And the second line may be oral prednisolone with cyclosporine or azosiprine or beta radiotherapy is the second line treatment and tibrotumo map or retoxo map. And this is how to treat site threatening graves or pathopathy, intravenous glucocorticoid, and the second, if no response, orbital decompression surgery. So today I will uh, send a link for two uh, for, for, of, uh, of my previous presentation. One of them, benign thyroid nodule, non-surgical options, and this is actually is presented in the Thyroalex 11. And another one, which is thyroid nodule simplified, stepwise approach for diagnosis and management of thyroid nodule, and uh, presented in the uh, UEDA. Uh, and also, any questions are welcome. And actually today uh, I will upload uh, this file to all who uh, subscribe. And actually I uh, upload, I send uh, the PDF file of day two, but it have uh, some mistakes uh, in the answering the questions. Some questions is not answered. Uh, so uh, I will upload this file. And also, I will upload the day today uh, PDF file uh, Zohri notes. Today, inshallah, it is not uh, final notes, but it is a pre-final. So I hope uh, each one try to study it. And also, I in the previous uh, session, I upload the study in uh, 2022 questions. And today, inshallah, I will upload, uh, send the questions and answer. This is the PDF file. And also, I will uh, send another uh, updated uh, question bank on examination, British Medical Journal on examination, uh, updated uh, file 2022 uh, for the thyroid questions. And uh, I will upload uh, questions only for British uh, on examination. And inshallah, in the next session, I will upload the question and answer.
and uh, also I will mention that uh, this is the YouTube channel uh, you can scan this uh, QR code so you can go to uh, this channel and in this channel you will go to the thyroid disorder playlist you will find all previous sessions in this and actually I uh, share the link for all who sub subscribe with me so the link uh, email uh, is shared for who subscribe so you will uh, when you will go to this this playlist you will see all previous presentation and inshallah i will upload uh, today a session inshallah today or tomorrow inshallah and you will find it in, uh, in this uh, list so thanks for all of you and if anyone has a question it is welcome yes Dr. Khaled, in clinical practice, it is important to make the patient new thyroid before radioactive iodine. Yeah. Which one, Dr. Mahawish? Before it's radioactive important. iodine? Uh, uh, to make new thyroid patient by... Actually, uh, this is a very important in a risk patient because the radioactive iodine ablation for many of graves this will aggravate cytotoxicosis. So, the aggravation of cytotoxicosis is a critical in elderly patient. So, in every day, in elderly patient or coronary heart disease patient, we should render the patient eosyroid. But in the young patient, we can go to the radioactive iodine immediately without rendering eosyroid. But actually, in most of our localities, we render the, the patient eosyroid before giving radioactive iodine ablation. And don't forget that if we give uh, carbimazole, we should stop it three to seven days before radioactive iodine ablation uh, treatment. Uh, excuse me, doctor. If the patient has developed a granulocytosis with antithyroid drugs, uh, and uh, yes. we want to refer uh, him to radioactive iodine or, or for surgery, but the patient still thyrotoxicosis. In this situation, in this situation, actually, in this situation, the levels iodide is important. It will decrease the hormone senses, but for short time, so we can give the levels iodide. This is a one. Also, corticosteroid have a role for rendering the patient uh, less uh, cytotoxic and also lithium and cholesteramine can be used. But this drugs is for short duration, just a bridge to the surgery. Not, not a patient uh, take it and uh, wait for a long duration. Because as we know that, uh, local iodide needs just working for just a few uh, weeks, not more than two weeks. After this, they, uh, they will escape phenomena and will be not effective. So this is the most important to render the patient less cytotoxic before doing the surgery. Dr. Khaled, for patients who have been uh, multinodular goiter and um, uh, they had thyroid 4 and the uh, final aspiration came back as normal. Um, so how long for do we need to follow up these patients? Actually, this is uh, my presentation in the Syro Alex, and actually I can share this uh, slide for, for follow-up according to the thyroid because this is a very important, but actually it is a recommended for thyroid for to follow up your patient uh, after one, two, three, and five years. And after five years, if all are uh, okay, no need to uh, do a follow-up except in uh, some of uh, conditions. This is Cyro Alex, this is one. Uh, because this actually is very important, uh, Dr. Ashraf. I, I will share just a follow-up for thyroid. This is one. So how to follow up your strategy for thyroid according to the thyroid? If the patient is thyroid is three in this situation, it'll follow up imaging one, three, and five years. And uh, your question about the thyroid 4, this is a moderately suspicious. We should scan 1, 2, 3, and 5 years. And for thyroid 5, 
every year for five years and this is very very important imaging can stop at five years if there is no change in the size uh, this is uh, as the answer of your question dr ashraf so uh, tyrant four we need to follow up after one two three and five years after five years if no change in the size no need to follow up and actually, this is a presentation. Actually, uh, Dr. Tamer and the uh, uh, Cyro Alex team will upload it uh, within a few days. Actually, they uh, upload some of uh, Cyro Alex 15, uh, and I will upload it. So, uh, thanks for all. If any question is welcome, uh, so thank you all and uh, see you later, inshallah, in the next Friday. I don't know, next Friday, inshallah, yom uh, Arafa. Um, I don't know uh, if it is candid to do a session in the next Friday or we can transfer it to the mid uh, week, uh, any day at the mid uh, week. Uh, so, I will. Okay, okay. Inshallah, the next session uh, will uh, cover uh, hypothyroidism, thyroiditis. Okay, thanks for all. Uh, see you later, Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Thank you, Dr. Khalid.